Please, Professor Gavashev, take the floor. Hello. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I'm not able to share the screen. Do you know if uh, there is a... Pro okay, I'm able now. I'm able now. Okay, good. Yes? Yes, it's working. Yes. Okay, please. Okay, so uh, now you should see the video that I recorded. Yes, it is. Hi, I am very happy to be with you here in CCS 2020. I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this chance of presentation. I'm Arsham from Trento University, and I hope that you will enjoy this talk about statistical physics of complex information dynamics. So this is all about complex systems, these large collections of entities that are interacting in non-trivial ways. And because we don't really have a clear view of the interactions, we are not able to uh, describe the macroscopic properties of these systems, including their emergent properties that are the holy grail for complexity science. Interactions are very different uh, across the systems, but they can all be described as information exchange among the entities of these systems. I give you three examples. In brain neurons exchange information using electrochemical signals, people of a society exchange information using text or voice messages, and this is the transport of people or good among transportation areas that define the information exchange in transportation landscapes. So information exchange can be a way to look at all these different physical attributes and uh, all the different nature of interactions happening there and uh, you know, uh, have a general view of uh, these systems. In this talk, I'm going to uh, introduce a unified framework to describe information dynamics and also I think you have to switch on your screen. Hello? Hello? I'm sorry, is it is it okay now? No, it's not okay. No. Okay, yes, now it's okay. Now it's, it's okay? okay? Thank you, thank you. Okay, good, good. Yes. So let me continue, sorry to derive uh, a macroscopic property of interacting units as an example of how this framework can be applied to uh, investigate the as different aspects of complex systems. To see the full derivations and complete description of the results that I'm going to discuss here, please visit our physical review e on the same topic because the time of presentation is shorter than it's needed to fully cover everything. To capture information dynamics, one needs to consider the structure, which is a network, and also the dynamical process governing the flow of information in, within the structure. Let's start with some definition. We show the nodes by canonical vectors. We have an adjacency matrix, which can be binary or uh, weighted, time-dependent, or static. And also, we assume a field on top of the network. If the field over time goes from one node to another, this means that these nodes have some information exchange happening there. The field, of course, uh, govern has its evolution governed by a very general type of dynamics, which we linearize to, to find a Schrodinger-like equation governing the evolution of the information field and derive from it a propagator that can uh, lead you to the solution of how the field propagates in the network. As an example, you can see a, a schematic view at the bottom of how the field propagates from one node, um, that is uh, to say t is equal to zero. Then you tune the propagation time to be larger and larger, and you will see that the field propagates from the node to its neighbors and to the community, and from that community to the other communities until it reaches an equilibrium. This is the way we are modeling the information flow in complex systems. For this specific example, I used the continuous diffusion, although you can, uh, you can describe 
many other types of dynamics using this shared in your like equation. In real world complex systems, it is really hard to track the activity of all the units. So you need a probabilistic initial condition. You cannot be sure which node would be the initiator of information flow. So in case you don't really have any idea which of them would be the initiator unit, you assign the uniform probability distribution and you obtain the expected flow of the field from each of the nodes and the expected exchange of the field between every pair of nodes. We can go even deeper. We can break the uh, propagator into its component. This is eigen decomposition. You get a set of uh, operators that are just the outer product of left and right eigen vectors of the propagator multiplied by the eigen values of the propagator. We have been able to show that uh, these operators are very meaningful. They uh, direct the information flow between the nodes. They are acting like information streams, and each of them are multiplied by a coefficient that is just um, the definition of the size of the information streams. To have a picture of it in your mind, this is a very simple uh, network of three nodes that I draw here. The diagrams below show the information streams corresponding to this system. There are three information streams. Blue arrows show positive fluxes between the nodes, and red arrows show uh, negative fluxes. And then there are self loops trapping the information on top of the initiator units and basically blocking the flow of information to the system. The trapped field, the field that each stream blocks is very important. It really determines the size of the stream. So how much field does a stream trap? It is equal to the size of that stream. This was one of our uh, first findings. And then uh, after that, you can conclude and argue that the trapped field is, con uh, is responsible for activation of streams. Because if the size of a stream is zero, it doesn't exist and it's not active. So as the trapped field grows, uh, the size of the information stream grows, and then it would be more active. And therefore, the trapped field can be considered responsible for generating the flow, because without the streams, there is no flow, and the trapped field is generating the streams, so it is the generator of information flow in the system. The overall trapped field can be uh, shown to be proportional to uh, the trace of the propagator, which we call Z, and we will show that it acts like the partition function for the system. So here, we are getting close to definition of density matrix. Let's assume that the field, the trapped field, is discretized into quanta carrying value H. In, if it, it really depends on the nature of the field. If it is energy, the quanta is the packet of energy. If it is a fluid, the quanta is infinitesimal volumes of the fluid. But this is important to show that uh, we have shown that uh, each quanta activates one of the information streams with a probability and generates the unit flow, which is the smallest element by which we are able to uh, describe the information flow in the system. The total flow is, of course, the summation of all uh, unit flows in the system. And as you can see, the unit flow is governed by uh, an operator rho, which is a superposition of information streams multiplied by their activation probabilities. This is very interesting and is a reminiscence of quantum statistical physics where you define the density matrix as superposition of quantum states multiplied by their probabilities. So probably this matrix is a good way to define the state of a complex system at uh, multiple propagation time scales. And it shows really the uh, lower to higher order interactions between the individuals or units of complex systems. Also, we can uh, define the mixedness of information streams in the same way that we define it for uh, quantum statistical physics, where you find the mixedness of states. The mixedness of quantum uh, in the mixedness of information streams can be obtained using the von Neumann entropy. It is interesting that if the dynamics is continuous diffusion, we see that the von Neumann entropy we uh, derived here is 
uh, in coincidence with the uh, spectral entropy proposed in 2016. And this is a very important uh, entropy for analyzing complex systems in, uh, uh, from an information theoretic perspective. So we are recovering one of the well-known definitions of entropy, and we are also generalizing it to other classes of dynamics. We are also shedding light on the physical grounds of these definitions. Let's talk about a very brief application of uh, this framework. So functional diversity is a characteristic of complex systems where uh, units that are similar are acting differently in the system. As an example, you can think of two neurons being in two different functional areas of human brain. They are involved in different functional tasks while uh, they are very similar in appearance at least. This might be a reason, uh, this might be a consequence of them being positioned differently in the structure and therefore handling the information differently. As an example, I'm showing the information flow from red and yellow node in this network. You can see that there is some similarity because they have some overlap, the information flow from these two nodes, but there is also the similarity. So uh, it's not that all of the flow is, uh, you know, uh, having an overlap uh, between the two nodes. So to quantify the dissimilarity of uh, these nodes as senders of information, we can find only the, um, uh, we can find a bunch of dissimilarity uh, measures, but I will focus on cosine dissimilarity. So you can compute the cosine dissimilarity between the flow vectors initiated from these two nodes, and also you can average over all the pairs of nodes in the system to get a, a picture of how uh, functionally diverse the nodes are as senders of information. Interestingly, uh, the mixedness of information streams is proportional to the uh, cosine, the average cosine distance of the nodes. And therefore, you can conclude that uh, information, uh, the mixedness of information streams or the von Neumann entropy of the system is quantifying the functional diversity of units in, the, in these systems. Interestingly, as the topological complexity increases, we see a boost in functional diversity of systems captured by von Neumann entropy. As you can see, even at large propagation time scales, which indicates the long range communications between the nodes, nodes remain functionally diverse if the uh, topology is hierarchical modular, while in random networks and in only modular networks, the functional diversity decays in a very quick fashion. So we see that probably this is a reason why hierarchical modular networks are prevalent in nature in different areas like in neural science or sociology. I'm going to conclusion. So we propose the unified framework to describe information dynamics. We have derived one uh, emergent properties, property of complex systems, which is the functional diversity. This is not um, limited to only functional uh, diversity. There has been uh, robustness and transport properties investigated, and we are looking forward for more follow-ups uh, to talk about with you. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll be looking forward to hear your questions, probably. Thank you very much for this very, very, very interesting talk. And the floor is open now for questions. Thank you. Any question? Questions? OK, let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, you use the Duason time ordering operator to create your uh, R function, the statistical weight. So you use, if I understood well, a first order time ordering operation on the stage. And then I think it was, do you have to say anything about the strength of the coupling? Because we expect a system, first of all, such a neurotic si a neural system, mm -hmm. the strength of coupling to be uh, random. Mm -hmm. We don't expect really a deterministic uh, coupling, which means that the system it becomes highly unpredictable. Mm -hmm. Do you have mm -hmm. to comment on this? 
Okay, so uh, the good point about this framework is that you put whatever structure you want into the framework. So if you have some network that changes over time or you have some probabilistic network, you can plug in into the framework. So that's not a problem with the framework. But of course, if we are talking about real world systems, there's always uh, things that we cannot be sure about. Okay, thank you very much indeed. You're welcome. It was a very, very, very interesting talk. Thank you very much for your interest. Okay, and let's, let us move to the, our next speaker, which is uh, Vasilios Konstadoudis. With the, and the subject of his talk, it will be complexity of micro and nanostructure surfaces. Vasilis, the- Hi, hi Kostas. Hi. Good evening, everybody. Yeah. I will share my screen. Unfortunately, I cannot activate my window. Okay. My video now camera. Okay. Now it's okay. So I'm I will show. Mine. Okay. I suppose you can uh, see my uh, my screen now. Yes, your screen can be seen now. Okay. okay. So the title the title of my of my talk is complexity of micro and nanostructure surfaces. And this work um, uh, has been done in the Institute of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology at uh, National Center for Scientific Research, Democritus, in collaboration with a laboratory of thermodynamics in emerging technologies at uh, ETH uh, University at uh, Switzerland. Uh, uh, the interesting thing is that uh, this work has been uh, started uh, uh, with a fund uh, from a meteorological uh, uh, project that about traceable 3D nanometrology and now is uh, continuing to be uh, funded by uh, application driven FET open project uh, harmonic. Uh, this means that uh, it tries to link uh, theoretical metrological uh, work with uh, uh, applications. Uh, the outline of, of, of the work I would like to share with you. First of all, my talk will start with a few words on what is nanotechnology and nano complexity and why we need to characterize it. I will present shortly the methodology we propose, uh, uh, the validation of this um, methodology in model surfaces, and I will show uh, applications uh, in experimental surfaces. Uh, uh, first of all, a definition of okay, nanotechnology uh, can be uh, described as the body of methods and techniques uh, which enable us to nanostructure surfaces and also material bulk so that they obtain uh, new properties and functionalities. The applications, the, the range of uh, nanotechnology applications is very widespread, uh, extending from nanoelectronics uh, to uh, transportation, cosmetics, uh, textiles, and uh, uh, in number uh, we can count more than uh, 10,000 nanoproducts uh, now in market. Uh, but uh, uh, what do we mean by nanostructuring or surfaces and why we need the concept of nano complexity? If uh, uh, we look at uh, scanning electron and atomic force uh, microscope images of uh, nanostructures, we will uh, uh, see uh, images like uh, those ones, except for some specific cases in which uh, uh, lithographic techniques have been have be used in order to produce them. The vast majority of uh, nanostructuring surfaces are, uh, have uh, morphologies between order and randomness. And uh, in some cases, they exhibit multi-scale hierarchical morphologies, and also they present long-range special uh, spatial uh, correlations. This means that uh, this is a good motivation to exploit uh, the complexity theory in order to build uh, uh, a characterization methodology to quantify spatial uh, nanocomplexity. Uh, up to now, such complex nanomorphologies have studied following three examples. The first is the surface roughness uh, theory, which, however, cannot capture the specific nature that uh, nanomorphologies many times exhibit. Uh, actually, 
uh, nanomorphologies in many cases they are not typical uh, rough surfaces they have more uh, complex uh, uh, appearances uh, the second approach is to use uh, nano nanoparticle metrology in which the focus is to identify some discrete uh, structures on your surface and to make statistical uh, analysis of these uh, structures but in many cases the drawback of this approach is that in many cases no clear definition of structures and also it's not very easy to identify and to quantify these structures the third approach is the fractal approach in which the basis is the scaling hypothesis but as we have found in many cases in nanomorphologies uh, the scaling hypothesis is scale limited so we need a more general approach which uh, will build on this approach not the, the, the aim is not to reject this approach but further advanced things advanced these approaches and uh, here is the challenge of uh, uh, nano complexity the, the main uh, demand the main aim here is uh, uh, to develop a method quantifying quantifying the complexity of nanostructure uh, surfaces. The new metric should present the maximum in between. Here you can see the two extreme cases of full homogeneous and symmetrical surfaces. And on the other side is the fully random surface. The complexity is uh, something in between. And the, here is the, the, the aim of this approach is to find a way to quantify the complexity of surfaces. Uh, the most usually uh, disorder parameters used in literature increase uh, monoton monotonically with uh, randomness. Here we want a measure which uh, uh, is maximized in between uh, symmetry and order and uh, randomness. And the key concept, the key idea is to focus on average symmetry in this case, if we use average symmetry, then we put on the same footing uh, the fully ordered and the fully random uh, cases. Uh, and uh, this means that we can uh, quantify complexity by using the amount of deviation from average or statistical uh, symmetry. That is, we have uh, tried to develop mathematical methodology to quantify the deviation of our structures of our nanomorphologies as shown in microscope images in order to uh, quantify complexity and the maximum and the information content of such uh, uh, structures since we are uh, since we refer to uh, deviation from symmetries uh, we can uh, assume that the concept of multi-scale entropy-based metrics would be very useful indeed in our uh, methodology the implementation of this uh, uh, concept starts with uh, uh, the calculation of local averages uh, around each point on the surface in order to generate the mass field that is uh, the uh, the amount of surface heights or pixel densities in an SEM in a microscope image, and uh, we apply this averaging uh, for uh, at its uh, at its scale r. So we generate a number of uh, uh, mass fields uh, for uh, its averaging scale. Then at its scale we calculate we quite quantify the homogeneity and the heterogeneity of this uh, uh, scale by calculating the entropy, uh, uh, the entropy of this uh, uh, mass field. And then we average this entropy over all scales. And this can be uh, defined as the complexity of our nanostructure morphology. And what do we expect? Uh, we expect that for uh, fully random, and fully periodic or homogeneous surfaces, the, the entropy will drop down quite uh, uh, rapidly. In the case of periodic surfaces, we expect some fluctuations, but overall, we expect that at large scales, there is there will be uh, low values of entropy. On uh, the contrary, we expect that in the case of complex morphologies, the entropy will uh, decrease, but at much slower slower uh, rates 
This means that uh, if we calculate the complexity, the average of these curves, we will find the maximum at the complex uh, cases. And uh, in order to validate our method, we have generated some synthetic surfaces. The first uh, type is uh, quite simple. And actually, we have uh, uh, started with a fully flat surface and we have replaced gradually the uh, this the points of this surface with uh, noise in order to uh, reach the fully noisy case at the other uh, uh, extreme of your um, calculations so the complexity if we calculate by following the previously described methodology then we found that we we have found that uh, the complexity exhibits a maximum uh, at uh, a value of uh, of uh, the fraction of replaced uh, points at about 70%. And then we take uh, a slow uh, decrease. Uh, so a similar result we have found in another example, more uh, uh, realistic, closer to real surfaces. Here we have uh, generated rough surfaces in which we have changed the correlation length of the surfaces. We have started with short, with small correlation lengths in which uh, the structure of the surface morphology looks like uh, a random field. And then we have uh, increasing, we have increased the correlation length and we have made the surface uh, smoother. Uh, again, the complexity, we have found that the complexity presents a maximum in between the random and the more, the more homogeneous uh, case. The third example is uh, mount surfaces. Mount surfaces consist of uh, a series of well-organized uh, mounts, and we have increased the randomness of these surfaces by randomizing the positions and the shapes of these uh, mounts. And again, we have found that the maximum of complexity uh, uh, is found in between uh, these extremes of fully ordered and uh, fully random uh, cases. We have, based on this uh, uh, validation findings, so we have applied our methodology in many experimental surfaces here. For the sake of, uh, to, to save time, I will focus on uh, on one case, in, uh, we have compared uh, aluminum surfaces etched uh, with, uh, after some processing steps, they have etched with uh, uh, copper chlorine and iron chlorine. And uh, the, their surfaces become very complex, multi scale. They present multi scale complexity. Here are some SM images, top down SM images from. Uh, the copper chloride uh, etching after the copper chl chloride etching and here after iron chloride etching. Uh, if we calculate the entropy versus scale, we have we find that in all scale, at all scales, the entropy of these surfaces of the copper chloride surfaces uh, of the aluminum surface after copper chloride etching are uh, larger, higher than the entropies of the iron chloride uh, surfaces. This means that if we calculate the complexity, it's clearly higher in these surfaces. And uh, quite interestingly, this uh, uh, theoretical finding uh, can be fit very nicely with experimental results, which uh, show that the surfaces of um, uh, of uh, the aluminum after copper chloride etching um, show highest heat transfer coefficient than uh, the aluminum surfaces after uh, iron chloride etching. This means that increased surface complexity can uh, lead to higher uh, heat transfer uh, coefficient. And to sum up uh, my uh, presentation, the problem we have uh, uh, faced with is the uh, is the characterization the quantification of uh, complex uh, morphologies uh, at nanoscales which lie between order and uh, randomness we have proposed a complexity based uh, method in order to characterize the deviation from average or statistical symmetry and this uh, uh, 
this uh, uh, quantity can be termed a nanocomplexity. And the first, we validated our method in synthetic model surfaces in order to justify our approach. And now we have started to apply this methodology in real experimental surfaces to disclose their uh, heterogene heterogeneity, morphological diversity and heterogeneity, heterogeneity and to link the morphology with uh, their uh, properties and functionalities. The future work will include more applications in the whole spectrum of nanostructure morphologies and also to develop and compare with other measures of uh, complexity. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, attention. Uh, thank you very much, Vasily, for this uh, interesting talk. And uh, I cannot see any question here. So is anybody that would like to have any question, please? Okay, uh, Vasily, what I notice is that uh, the entropy is increasing, is increasing at the nanostructure. Uh, but when we have microstructures, the entropy more or less remains the same. Uh, can you comment on this? And uh, what it will be the added value? If, for example, we know to the pixels, I can see here, below 30 pixels. Uh, what kind of, I would say, information can we extract from this? Okay, we mean, uh, very nice question. We mean, uh, uh, your question is about the meaning of these uh, curves, yes. which show yeah. that at large scales, there is uh, a flatness and uh, there is no strong uh, variation of entropy. And uh, this is true. And uh, this is uh, why, okay, the pixel here is uh, uh, some tens of nanometers. And so uh, this is about micron. And uh, uh, the concept here is uh, that uh, uh, the processing of the surfaces um, aims at nanopatterning, at the nanopatterning. That is, uh, the aim is to add morphology and to create new fluctuations uh, or at uh, small scales in order in order to uh, to put more functionalities uh, at this uh, at these scales so we can see that by this uh, by this curve that the entropy is more at small scales at the same time it is true that uh, we expect from by definition that the entropy will have a decreasing uh, behavior versus uh, scale because the other aging, as we move uh, at, at higher scales, uh, is, is better. But the degree of this, the rate of this uh, decrease is the point here. Okay, so if we, if we see that this rate is quite slow, this means that uh, the morphological diversity uh, remains and it's quite important at these scales. If it's more uh, steeper, like in the random cases, then it means that uh, we, uh, we don't have a morphological diversity, morphological uh, heterogeneity in our surfaces. Thank so it is, it is a quantitative way to engineer the scaling uh, behavior of our surface. Thank you very much, Vasily. Okay. We have another question. Okay, let us now move to our next talk, which is by Dr. Ki Chang, and the, with the title of his talk, Ensemble Non-Equivalence System with Local Constraints. Please, Dr. Chang, I can see you. The first <laughs> Thank you, Pastor. Okay. Uh, I will sh share the recording. Yeah. Uh, huh? I'm sorry, I need to share the
Hello everyone, my name is Chi Zhang. I'm coming from Leiden University of the Netherlands. Today, the topic of my report is Ensemble Long Equivalence in System with Local Constraint. This is a joint work with my superior, Dr. Diago Galastredi. First, I want to introduce the system with local constraints. As we already know, in the physics research, we most focus on the system with global constraints, like the system with fixed total energy or fixed temperature. However, recently research on networks and the other general system also find there is some new system which is under local constraints, like the networks with degree sequence or the multiple time series with constraints on each time, even like the proton with fixed amino acid sequence or the genes with fixed number of nucleotides. For those systems, we also want to know like what the structure of the networks with fixed degree is more likely to appeal or what is the normal state of the stock market to avoid the financial crisis, or even like the, which structure of the proteins with fixed um, amino acid sequence is more likely to appear. Actually, what we really want to know is the probability of each state in the system with local constraints to appear in the real process. However, those systems have a huge number of components and uh, different kind of interactions because of the local constraints. It is impossible to describe those systems by the random variable with finite outcomes. So we need the statistic ensembles from physics to describe those systems with local constraints. Practically, in this work, we use the matrix ensemble to describe the system with local constraints, where each state in the system with local constraints will be represented by a n times m matrix. The local constraints will be the column local constraint. Well, each constraint is the sum of all the elements in each column, or the row local constraint, where the element in the constraint is the sum of all the units in each row. To have the statistic ensembles, we need based on the maximum entropy principle and the macroscopic property of the constraints we have. So when the constraint is hard, we need to describe it by the microcanonical ensemble. When the constraint is soft, we can describe it by the canonical ensemble. The microcanonical ensemble is used to describe the isolated system in traditional statistic physics. In this work, it also used to describe the, the system with local constraint where the local constraint is fixed to equal to each other in all the states. So actually, the probability of each state in the microcanonic ensemble is also equal to each other, and it is decided by the total number of configurations in the system, which is represented by the omega c star in our formulation. This constraint in the microcanonic ensemble is called soft or called hard, because each state should have the same value of constraint, which is equal to C star. However, when the constraint is soft, we need to describe by canonic ensemble. In the canonic ensemble, the probability of each state will be assigned with different value due to the different constraint in each state. And we can got the probability of each state by the definition of Hamiltonian and partition function. Here, we can find the theta. Theta actually is the same like the inverse temperature in the traditional kinetic ensemble. But there, it's also the maximum likelihood parameter who will go into maximum the channel entropy of the kinetic, entropy, kinetic probability distribution and realize the constraints, like the average value of constraints in it it's equal to a specific value. When we state the value of theta to equal to theta star, where the average value of constraints in the canonical ensemble is equal to the hard constraint in the micro ensemble, then the two ensemble descriptions will be conjugate with each other. According to the assumption in the traditional statistic physics, in the thermodynamic limit, the two conjugate ensemble will be equivalent to each other. 
This is called ensemble equivalence. In under the ensemble equivalence, the microcanonic ensemble can be replaced by the canonic ensemble, which is mathematically easy to obtain. However, ensemble equivalence is not always hold. Recent research on the quantum quantum phase separation and the nuclear fragmentation also found that the ensemble equivalence will be broken in the phase transition, in the boundary of phase transitions. Normally we have, right now, we have three definitions of ensemble line equivalence. The Mercier ensemble line equivalence, the serodynamic ensemble line equivalence, and the microscopic ensemble line equivalence. The three ensemble line equivalence is already proved to equivalent to each other. Here we were focused on the Mercier ensemble line equivalence, which is the probability distribution of microcanonic ensemble and canonic ensemble have a long leg measurable difference in the thermal dynamic limit, like what we show in the picture. So actually, there is always a gap between the pro probability distribution of the two ensembles in the thermal dynamic limit. Right now, they already have two mechanisms can be used to describe the ensemble line equivalence in statistic physics. One is the phase transition ensemble line equivalence. This ensemble line equivalence is the one founded in the traditional physical system. It is appears on the boundary of phase transitions, which is caused by the long reach interactions. It happens at a specific place of the parameter space. And the fluctuation of constraints have the same order as the constraint itself. Another one is the local constraint ensemble line equivalence. This kind of ensemble line equivalence is a pairs in the whole parameter space, and it is caused by the extensive number of constraints in one absence of phase transitions. The phase transitions ensemble line equivalence is strong, but restricted because it only appears in specific place of the parameter space. But the local constraint ensemble line equivalence is general, but weak, because the fluctuation is not as strong as the one in the phase transition. Normally, we use the relative entropy to quantify the difference between the two ensemble descriptions. Here, we also use the rescaled relative entropy density, the smallest, to quantify if the system is under ensemble line equivalence. When the value of small s is bigger than zero, then this system with local constraint is under ensemble line equivalence. We also introduce the relative entropy ratio, which is used to quantify which is used to detect the strong ensemble line equivalence, because as we mentioned, in the phase transition place, the ensemble line equivalence is strong because the fluctuation of constraints is in the same order as the constraint itself. So there, we use the relative entropy, the ratio between the relative entropy and the kinetic entropy to quantify how is the ratio come, will change through the uh, increase of system scales. So when the value of R is bigger than zero in the third line limit, then we can know that this system will be under strong ensemble line equivalence. Normally, as we mentioned before, we believe that in the local constraint system, the ensemble line equivalence is weak, but general, and general. So, but uh, surprisingly, in our research on the matrix ensemble, we also find uh, a strong and general ensemble line equivalence in the system with local constraints. Here we still use the matrix to describe the system with local constraint, and each state is the n times m matrix, but the constraint will be the local row constraint, where each constraint will be the sum of all the elements in each row of the matrix. And we can easily get to the Hamiltonian definition and the partition markation and the probability of kinetic ensemble based on the uh, Boltzmann distribution. And we can, we also need to get the microcanonic probability, but it's a little difficult to calculate the, the omega C star in the local constraint. However, in 2017, Glasserly and Scott and have proposed a new method to estimate the value of omega C star from the kinetic ensemble and the covariance matrix of constraints in kinetic ensemble, which means that when we go in to check if this system is under ensemble line equivalence or not, we even do not need the information from microcanonic ensemble. We can based on the covariance matrix of constraints in kinetic ensemble to check if this system will be under ensemble 
run equivalence. So actually there we go, we calculate exactly the value of relative entropy, and we also use the common matrix of constraints to approach the results. We find that those two results actually is equivalent to each other, and the relative entropy is growing in the same order as the system's scales, which means that the system is under ensemble line equivalence. We also calculate the, react, the specific value of the relative entropy ratio of the binary and the weighted matrix. We also find in the thorough dynamic limit, when we set the local constraint equal to each other, we can find the relative entropy ratio is growing like ln 2 pi m by divided by m. When the value of m is finite, then we can find that the relative entropy ratio will be bigger than zero. When the m is uh, going to infinite, the relative entropy ratio will go back to zero, which means that the system will go back to weak ensemble line equivalence. So when we go inside the matrix ensemble, when we treat each row as a particles, then we can find a matrix ensemble actually is can be used to describe a system with n particles, and each particles have m degree of freedom. So actually, we can roughly say that uh, in the system with local constraint, when each particle have finite degree of freedom, then it should be in the strong ensemble line equivalence. Based on the information we show above, actually we can give three points in the conclusion. The first one is that using kinetic ensemble to approach the microkinetic ensemble will have a non-negligible difference in the system with local constraints. The another one is that in the, differ the difference can be quantified by the common matrix of constraints in kinetic ensemble. Actually, this mechanism is much more general than we think be before. The third one is that the ensemble long equivalence caused by the local constraint can be both general and strong when the units in the system have a finite degree of freedom. Actually, our results show that in the application of statistical ensemble in the chemistry, physics, in the theoretical research or practicals, the ensemble long equivalence in the system with local constraint will affect the result of our replacing of statistical ensembles. So when we're going to focus on the when we're going to apply the statistical ensembles in the research of complex network, complex systems, we should uh, pay more attention about the ensemble line equivalence because it may. Thank you very much, Mr. Chang, for your interesting talk. And uh, let me see if we have any questions. No, no. we don't have. Uh, <laughs> Any question? Okay, uh, this interesting talk. Uh, always I'm wondering if the strength of the constraints with the strength of fluctuations. This must be, I think, important if I understand well your, uh, your talk. So, can you comment on this? What is the strength of constraints? A constraint must have a kind of potential energy or a kind of strength, a kind of force. What is the actual uh, strength? What it would be compared with what in order to say or to conclude that we have constraints? Can you comment on this? Uh, actually, we, we uh, recently we do one uh, new model, which is under the weighted networks. So when the weighted is going to condense in the specific nodes in the networks, then the fluctuation will still exist it for, for the constraints. But uh, this one is not uh, enough to support uh, the, the, the strong ensemble line equivalence. It's still under the ensemble line equivalence. Yes. Okay. So if I, <laughs> I don't know if I have understand correctly your question. So you ask uh, how is the fluctuation Will yes, be. I understand that uh, these uh, uh, constraints, which always a constraint is characterized by a kind of energy and the kind yes. of potential and force. So this energy and potential of the constraint, I think, must be connected to the local fluctuations. Yes, yes, correct. Am I correct? 
Yes, yes. So actually, it's 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 the it's a it's a fluctuation of the freedom a free energy will cause the ensemble line equivalence when there is a local constraints because everyone is fluctuation. So the total fluctuation will be uh, strong and uh, will be appeals in the systems. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Kastos. And uh, now we have to move in our last but not least talk by Andrea Rabizarda, which is acoustic emission in compression of building materials few statistics enables the anticipation of the breakdown point. Yes, I'm here. <clears throat> Sarda. Yeah. Or yours. <laughs> so may I share the screen? Can see you very well. Not now. Okay, yes. now now you should see my screen. Yes, now I can see you. Okay. And uh, I see your screen now. Okay. So we can proceed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you too. So uh, I'm Andrea Pisarda. I'm a professor at University of Catania at the Department of Physics and Astronomy. And I will present uh, this study that was published last, uh, this year. Uh, this study is about acoustic emission in compression of building materials. And uh, we applied Q statistics in order to anticipate the breakdown point. So uh, this is our team uh, composed mainly by colleagues, uh, engineers uh, of our university, Annalisa Greco, Andrea, uh, myself, of course, uh, Alessandro Pluchino, Gabriele Fichera, and Loredana Contrafatto in collaboration with Costantino Zallis for, from uh, Rio de Janeiro. Okay, let's see what we have done. Uh, we have studied uh, acoustic emission testing uh, measured in um, uh, several uh, materials, uh, brittle materials, uh, which uh, were uh, compressed. Uh, usually when materials are compressed, they emit uh, this uh, um, uh, localized stress energy, uh, which propagate as an elastic wave. And uh, if you put some sensors, you can uh, record these uh, acoustic uh, emissions. And uh, uh, the, the hope is just to predict uh, several statistical features which enables to predict the, the, um, the breakdown point. The materials that we are study, studied are concrete and basalt. And we applied several uh, cyclic compressions until the breakdown point. So let's see um, the uh, kind of materials. The first one is concrete, uh, which is an artificial conglomerate, which consists of uh, cement, water, and sand and gravel within a certain appropriate recipe. And uh, it was prepared 28 days before the test in order to allow some hardening of the material. The second one is a very common rock that we have here in Sicily, living uh, below mount mountain uh, volcano, and uh, it's basalt. Um, so when magma comes out, uh, it uh, uh, cools down and uh, when it, it is in contact with the atmospheres and uh, this stops the crystallization process. And uh, we have a very compact stru structure of these rocks, uh, which have a very excellent uh, resistance to mechanical stresses. Okay, so this is our experimental setup. We have an hydraulic press, which is connected to a data acquisition unit. Uh, you may see here uh, in, the, in the middle, just the hydraulic press, then the acquisition unit. And uh, just in the middle, you see the specimen of uh, concrete in this case, which was uh, coupled uh, with the acquisition system through a piezotron acoustic emission sensor. This is uh, uh, another picture of this uh, press and the two specimens after the breakdown point. What we have done is uh, we've applied uh, some cyclic uh, compressions. And uh, first of all, we observed uh, the so-called Kaiser effect. That is uh, uh, the material emits uh, these uh, acoustic uh, uh, emissions uh, only if you increase uh, uh, the compression after a certain point. 
then you release the compression and uh, you start again, but uh, the um, acoustic emission starts again uh, when uh, the load overcomes the, the previous one. So we did this uh, uh, for the two kind of materials, uh, uh, concrete and basalt, and these are the, the plots uh, for two samples. And then we studied the inter-event time, delta tau, uh, in order to see the kinds of statistics that we obtain. Here on the left, you see concrete and on the right, basalt. And this is just the last nodding before the breakdown. And you see that uh, the, the acoustic emissions are clustered and the inter-event time shows a very nice uh, distribution, a power law distribution, which has a slope, which in the case of concrete is a minus 1.6. And in the case of basalt, is minus 1.9. So this shows that we have a kind of complex behavior just before the breakdown point. Uh, then we studied the, the complementary cumulative distribution function for uh, these inter-event times. Uh, that is the, uh, the fraction of inter-event times greater than a certain value delta tau. Uh, these are reported on the right for the two samples of concrete and the two samples of basalt. As you can see, you can fit very well this behavior with a, a decreasing expo uh, Q exponential, which is uh, indicated here on the left. And uh, this function uh, has two parameters, Q and beta Q, which is an inverse temp effective temperature, TQ. And this is the kind of function which maximize the um, uh, Q entropy, which is the generalization of entropy of the Boltzmann Gibbs entropy, when you have uh, correlations in your system. In fact, Q, the entropic index Q, is considered a measure of strong correlation in the system. When Q is equal to one, you have no correlations. Uh, as you see in our case, Q is greater than one in, in all cases. And TQ can be considered an effective temperature, which indicates the level of noise that you have in your system, in your process or uh, fracturing process. So we reported then uh, the values that we have obtained in this plot, uh, where you observe for the different samples and the different materials. We had two uh, samples for uh, the two different materials that we studied, basalt and concrete, and you see a different behavior. So uh, we uh, think they belong to two universality classes. And in any case, um, when you approach the uh, breakdown point, which is uh, when you go from C to B and then to A, A is just the last loading, B is the second to last loading and C is the third to last loading. You see in the case of concrete uh, that there is a, a decreasing uh, behavior of Q, uh, but the effective temperature goes to zero. While in the case of basalt, you see that uh, it, uh, an increasing trend in the value of Q and uh, also in this case, uh, uh, going towards the breakdown point, uh, the temperature goes to uh, zero. Then we compared also this measure that we did uh, with uh, some data that uh, came from this other paper uh, here on, on the bottom. Uh, it's a paper by a Greek group that studied uh, um, a similar material within a similar experiment. It's not exactly uh, the same, uh, it's white mortar, but uh, it's uh, also a conglomerate uh, material similar to concrete. And you see that uh, uh, the trend is similar to the, our case of concrete, although the values of Q are slightly less than the, the one we obtain. So uh, to conclude, uh, we have observed two different behavior for the two uh, materials that we have studied, concrete and uh, basalt. And uh, this is because concrete uh, is a composite material 
So uh, you can see that uh, the, the cracking uh, evolves along some um, um, mesoscopic uh, um, preferential lines that you observe also with your eye and uh, which form this long range correlation uh, that increase the value of Q. Uh, on the other hand, the, the, the dynamics of the breakdown uh, for basalt is quite different uh, since uh, basalt is a material which is much more compact and homogeneous and breaks down almost immediately because uh, it resists to strong compressions in a kind of explosive way. Um, we think that uh, if this uh, test uh, will be confirmed uh, in future experiments that uh, we are analyzing, this could be very useful in order to predict uh, uh, within a kind of health monitoring uh, strategy, uh, non-destructive, uh, the, um, the conditions of very big buildings and bridges in order to predict uh, uh, the, uh, to anticipate, uh, let's say, the breakdown point and to avoid uh, problems. So uh, this is the end. I thank you for your attention. This is our group and uh, I'm here for uh, your uh, uh, questions, if there are. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for the very interesting uh, talk, Professor Rebisate. And uh, do we have any questions for this interesting talk? I don't see any question. Okay. Okay. That was very interesting. And, and I'm wondering how, if, is relating this uh, entropic parameter with the number of cracks in the, for example, say in a metal, let's take a metal structure and uh, there is a uh, entropy, for example, of cracking in metals. And this is relating with the cracks. Do you have to comment on this? If it's a, sim a similarity with the concrete materials? And actually, I don't know. Uh, are you referring to some published paper? Uh, yes, I'm referring to a lot of work which relates in metals the number of cracking of micro cracks or nano cracks with the entropy of the system. And uh, actually, uh, I am wondering if, if is this parameter, this Q parameter, in this application is related as well with the number of cracks. Okay, I actually don't know about this, uh, these uh, papers, but I would be very much interested in that. If, if you can provide me yes, the, the literature, uh, <laughs> I, okay. I'm very much interested because this was uh, uh, our first uh, um, test, our first study in this direction. So uh, we knew this uh, study by the Greek group, uh, by uh, I didn't know any other uh, connection uh, of this kind uh, with the Q statistics. So I would be very much interested in, uh, in reading uh, these papers. Okay, thank you very much indeed. I will try to find them and just communicate. Okay, them. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, and with this last talk, I think we have to end the session. I thank you all of you. I hope you are safe in these difficult times. And then let of all of us try to do our best. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Bye bye. Thank you very much, Costas. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>